Hi, if you're just joining us, I'm Matilda Gregg, the lead organiser of this workshop. This paper is part of a panel called Gender and Sexuality, which deals with the central question of what a military body or way of dressing or acting or cutting your hair is. If it's fair to say that we usually think of warriors as stereotypically masculine, how do warrior women or queer women or gender non-conforming women complicate our ideas about who fights and how and why? What you're about to watch is a discussion between a team of researchers who have digitised more than 100 English warrior women ballads dating back all the way to the 1650s. The video offers a tantalising glimpse into gender roles, love and romance more than 300 years ago and provides a template for any teachers or educators thinking of setting up a similar project for their students. This next paper takes the form of a panel discussion between participants in the Warrior Women Project, a collaborative digital humanities initiative based at the English department at Wayne State University in Detroit. The project was developed during a course taught by Professor Simone Chess last year and further taken forward by a team of graduate students, resulting in a rich website full of additional teaching and research resources. Speaking about their experiences putting this project together today are lead investigators Simone Chess, Wayne State PhD students uh, Erica Carbonara, Kelly Plant and Robert Chapman Morales, and Lindsay Regal Miller, now a PhD student at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. The title of the discussion is Building the Warrior Women Project, Digital Humanities and a Broadside Ballad Archive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that introduction. Hello to everyone and welcome. Um, our panel is the culmination of a collaborative project between myself and several graduate students in English at Wayne State University, as Matilda was saying, um, which came to fruition out of a series of courses, uh, an initial course where we did um, planning and imagining what we might do, and then a second semester where we worked at sort of manifesting what we did. Uh, in the short time today, that we have, I wanna discuss our work in building what we call the Warrior Women Project. And I'm gonna start with some general background about the Warrior Women Ballads that we've been working with. Then our project manager, Kelly Plant, will say a little more about the nuts and bolts of our technical work. And then we'll use the rest of our time to share more about our process of envisioning the project, designing a database, doing the work of building a functional site, and ultimately the kinds of research and future research and scholarship that we think the Warrior Women Project enables for all of us. So at the core of our project are a collection of more than 100 broadside ballads printed in English between 1650 and 1850. The ballads are set in England, Ireland, America, and in colonial and military sites all over the world. They represent a diversity of political and ideological perspectives and a wide range of attitudes about sex, gender, gender roles, love, and romance. But what they all have in common is that in each of more than 100 ballads, a character who was assigned female at birth seriously considers or actually undertakes dressing as and passing for a male soldier or sailor. The Warrior Women Ballads are richly underexplored resources for thinking about pre-modern feminism, gender, and sexuality. I know for myself personally, they've changed the way that I think about early modern queer and trans studies, for instance, in work I've done about male pregnancy in the ballads, and also uh, the way that I think about the co-construction of femininity and whiteness, um, something a lot of us have thought about through engaging in the ballads. These ballads are funny and body and weird, and our team's goal in creating our project and sharing it with you today is to make sure that these ephemeral cheap print sources have an accessible place in warrior women's studies and in early modern studies more broadly. So having said that, a little bit about the stakes of our project, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly to say a little bit more about how we built it. Thank you, Simone. So I'm Kelly Plant. I've served as the project manager for the Warrior Women Project. I'll describe the database and the website that we built together. This project has been a collaborative experiment in a decentered fashion as we co-invented a digital home for the 113 ballads cataloged by Diane Dugau and published her index as a searchable research tool and a historical record in its own right. Though Professor Dugau published her dissertation research in her monograph, The Warrior Woman in Popular Balladry, 1650 to 1850. Her typewritten catalog of ballads has never been pu published or archived until now. 
capitalizing on the rampant scanning of broadside ballads that has occurred since that time, we developed our own digital critical edition hyperlinked with essays that contextualize and analyze the ballads. They link to facsimile copies on EBBA, Early English Books Online, 18th Century Collections Online, English Short Title Catalog, to name the most prominent. Designing with the end in mind, we used a project management philosophy of decisions made by consensus, and we used WordPress for sustainable content management. Intersectional feminist feminism governed our readings of the ballads and our teamwork methodologies. Now users can map, sort, and search across 45 categories and 40 tags. Some of the categories include overnight visit slash shared bed, returns to feminine dress, lover disapproves, and some tags include keywords that frequently appear in the ballads, such as maiden, captain, hands, cheeks, lips, and fair. We also incorporated, because it's a, a finished project, but we're always seeking to improve, we have a user feedback form on the site so that users can let us know what we think, what they think. Thank you, Kelly. And I think I belatedly forgot to thank our organizer, Matilda, and also our partner, the English Broadside Ballad Archive at UC, at UC Santa Barbara in California. I'm nervous speaking to the screen. <laughs> in any case, thank you, Kelly. I now wanna open our discussion to the rest of the panel with two questions for you each to answer briefly. First up, can you each share some of your thoughts and experiences working on this project, designing our database and doing the work of building it? What worked and what didn't? What did you learn and what was the surprise? And I think we'll start with Erica. Hi, thank you, Simone. Um, okay, so perhaps the most profound result of the process of digitizing and cataloging Dugau's ballad collection is my immense respect for digital humanity scholars. Um, even though the corpus of ballads we were working with was relatively small, the process itself was often arduous, tedious, and time-consuming. Despite this, the end result was well worth the effort, though I have certainly realized that my place is not within digital scholarship, and I have an even deeper respect for the databases that I rely upon to do my own work, um, considering the amount of work I know that goes into creating them. So we began the work of cataloging after we had read all 113 ballads. So we already had an idea of the thematic trends and important keywords before we began the work of transcribing the ballads. In my opinion, this work we did in between reading the ballads and cataloging them was the most difficult. As a team of eight, it was difficult to make sure that everyone's voices were heard and respected as we made decisions of what keywords were important what the formatting of the website should look like, and what the answer to difficult questions such as, is the intention to cross-dress the same as actually cross-dressing and how do we catalog this? Which was a question that we had often <laughs> while reading the 113 ballads. Um, although this was the most trying part of the process, it was also the most fun and rewarding for we were able to draw attention to our own textual interests and voice what we thought should be emphasized or searchable in our online database. This also assured that our database searches were well-rounded and representative of collective interests. Once we had the parameters of our database outlined, the less cerebral work of transcribing each ballad, assigning it categories and keywords, searching each ballad on other databases, such as EBA, EBO, and BBO, and quality control checking each other's work began. What I found most interesting in doing this portion of the work was the ways in which the parameters we had all agreed upon began to break down and become blurry as we scrutinized each ballad. This process really emphasized the editorial decisions that go into creating and catalog cataloging databases, excuse me, uh, whether digital or tangible. And that is what I have to share about my process. Thanks, Erica. Robert? So for me, uh, to follow up with what Erica said, I uh, gained a newfound respect for the digital digital humanities as well. Um, I hadn't heard of it before the course that I took with Simone, the Warrior Women Project course. And in that course, I uh, came to enjoy the digital humanities, the project itself for a variety of reasons. Um, first, I enjoyed working with the team. There was something 
new for me in English studies, and I think new for most people in, in English studies. And I enjoyed uh, being able to plan this out with the team members, uh, look at everything um, that we could do to improve the site, make it functionable, and um, with an eye towards the end user. Um, it was also really enjoyable to read the ballads themselves, to read about these warrior women, um, to look at them, look at um, how we could study them, how we could um, you know, write uh, papers at the end about them as far as the critical essays and the contextual essays that we did for the course. Um, but I also really enjoyed the different speakers that we had um, during the course as far as um, we met with Ebba, we had met with Diane Dugau. So it was really enjoyable to be able to use the digital space to hear from these different um, partners, I'll say. And um, especially with the EBBA project, being able to hear about what worked with their own project with ballads, um, what went well, how it was like working with the team. Um, and it gave me an eye towards uh, the professional field after um, academia, if you will. And it gave me um, a look into another avenue I could possibly pursue um, later on in my career. So it was really um, eye-opening for me. And it was um, good to see that there are different avenues if I decide I don't want to end up going the teaching route, scholarship route, all of that. But at the same time, being able to work with a team like this, being able to not only produce scholarship, but also um, think about the digital space and the unique possibilities there. That was something that um, I really enjoyed diving into. And then especially now um, with everything going on with the uh, COVID pandemic, it's been really essential to look at the online space and the benefits there, what we can do with that space. And this project was um, a good taste for that before everything went down. Um, so thank you. I look forward to any questions later on. Okay, so me now? Okay, so coincidentally, Prior to working as a PhD student at Wayne State on life writing in the long 18th century, I worked as a project manager for the United States Marine Corps and Army for several years. This experience not only provided context for my interest in the warrior women who were working in the military, but as one who had personally done so, and it also allowed me to put my project management and technical publishing skills to practical use for studying these early modern fictional and non-fictional adventurous women. I used to work as a team leader in a heavily male dominated field of automotive combat equipment maintenance. This taught me the value of not necessarily using the most cutting edge, but rather the most sustainable and easy to use processes for the entire team. Having worked uh, my way up the chain of command um, as one of the only women that my male infantry colleagues had worked with, the warrior women who had to assume male dominating qualities to achieve their goals spoke to me. I'm thrilled that we were able to finish this semester, even such a crazy one as winter 2020 in the midst of the pandemic with a site that functions interactively according to our intersectional decentered theory and that brings the warrior women trope to life. Thank Lindsay. you for that, Kelly. And I'm sorry, Lindsay, could you answer now? For sure. Um, so being in this class, I imagined building the website from scratch and really delving into the technical aspects of the website. I imagined perhaps naively that we would be able to reduce a fully searchable archive in one semester, um, a lot like the EBA website and the Bodley and Ballads online, which are both websites that we looked at. While we did have discussions and presentations about what, you know, that would look like, we never really got to that point, mostly because Kelly said, we found that we needed to use a tool that was simpler to learn and use by many people, most of whom did not have any tech backgrounds. So the website itself was not as complicated as, as I had originally imagined. The amount of work on the ballads themselves also surprised me and made me realize how limited our time was in regards to the technology because we had to prioritize the ballads over the website themselves itself. Still, uh, I was excited in the second semester to be a part of the tech team during which uh, the, the, we broke into different teams and we were able to kind of explore more deeply the tech aspects of the project and, and building the website itself. So even though we had to kind of change our priorities halfway through, or at least I felt like I had to change my priorities halfway through, I think the website itself is really easy to use and, and valuable, um, although it maybe isn't 
quite as complicated as some of the other ones. So I'm really happy with how it turned out. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, how did working on the Warrior Women Project or engaging with this collection of Warrior Women ballads more broadly inform your current or future research? And we'll start with Erica again. Um, all right, so although I will talk briefly about the specific research that originated with this project, I would like to spend just a moment talking about the ways in which this project impacted me on a more global level, um, as I think some of my peers have talked about already the global impacts of what we've done, and I think that's important. Um, so just spending so much time focused on assessing and cataloging the text as a text and not necessarily always for what the text was saying has shaped my thinking as I approach every text I encounter as a researcher by forcing me to grapple with issues of identification and classification and the, potential, the potentially arbitrary method of assigning text to categories by an unknown third party. More pragmatically, this process has helped me as I think about my own research and how I think about the relationships between texts. This has been particularly fruitful as I approach my qualifying exams in the upcoming semester, which is terrifying, and began a different sort of classifying and um, drawing relationships between texts. So more specifically, the research that arose from this project uh, is directly related to my larger interests in early modern BDSM practices and notions of consent. I was able to research issues of consent in both of the main papers I produced for the website one of which focused on non-consent in the military by way of the practice of impressment, and the other which focused on the non-consensual confinement of daughters by their fathers. In this second essay, I argued that this confinement ultimately acted as a queer catalyst for these confined daughters who were ultimately able to escape their captivity and follow their cross-dressed lovers to war. This essay allowed me to explore issues of queer captivity father-daughter relationships, and the complex relationship between confinement and identity, all of which are currently underrepresented, underrepresented and under-discussed in early modern scholarship. Read together, the two essays I produced for this project depict early modern displays of normative masculine and feminine confinement. My research was aided by the searchable database we created as I was able to search specifically for ballads that fit the categories of woman cross-dresses, involuntary enlistment of lover, and prison, among others. In January, I was also able to present this paper at the Multidisciplinary Graduate Conference at the Newberry Library in Chicago, Illinois, and it's quite possible that the issue of confinement discussed in this essay will function as the basis for some of my dissertation work. Um, perhaps the most exciting part of my research, however, was the work I was able to do with Simone's undergraduate students who were some of our very first users of the, the database, as we were able to see firsthand how our database worked in action and we could envision how it could aid in future scholarship. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. So for me, I'm, I'll also uh, jump off the theme of global first and then moving to my research. Search. And I think for me, what I really enjoyed um, with this project was breaking down the text into those different units and thinking about, okay, if someone was studying this text, what would they be looking for? What might be a, a helpful thing for them to, to be able to sort out? And so I think that it showed the possibilities for collaboration within English studies that we can do some of that legwork um, up front so that we can do this, this new nuanced research, this new type of research where um, we get these, these categories first, then we can start looking at the text based on those categories without having to necessarily do it all ourselves or individually. Um, but also within the project itself, I really enjoyed um, the text that we read, the ballads that we read, and it came back to a theme that I've already been um, interested in from my undergraduate years when I took a Shakespeare survey course um, and read Shakespeare's As You Like It. And within that text, as uh, many of you would know, um, Rosalind uh, cross-dresses, so female to male, as um, Ganymede. And um, that text has uh, stuck with me through all of my English studies. In fact, it sparked my interest in English studies. Shakespeare's um, plays in and of themselves did that, but this play especially I felt drawn to. And so now looking 
um, towards the end of my uh, PhD studies here and looking for a dissertation topic that I'd be interested in. And with this work that I've done together with this team, um, I think I'd be really interested in continuing with that play, looking at that theme of female to male cross-dressing and starting to um, compare it with um, other tales, looking at similarities, differences, what we can learn there. And within the course during the directed study portion, I looked at um, the context of the wars that were discussed in the ballads and added to the site that way. And I think that what I liked about this site was looking at the um, big picture of research in and of itself. So looking at all of the different pieces together, the context, bringing that together to inform the um, claims that we, we make with um, text and the analysis that we do with text. So I think in the future with my dissertation, hopefully working with As You Like It, um, Shakespeare's play there, and hopefully working with this site as well, being able to search through and um, draw some conclusions that way. So I think it's definitely informed the uh, work that I would like to do moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly. At a regional conference of the American Society for 18th Century studies in February, I presented my essay that's published on the scholarship tab in our website called uh, Marketing Empire about military and companionate marriage recruitment in the uh, warrior women ballads. I found that these ballads reveal an important connection between two expanding markets during and leading up to the long 18th century the expanding British empire and its market for soldiers and the expanding institution of the companionate marriage. The connection I found is that both markets relied upon pop culture representations of the physical and monetary benefits of objectifying and idealizing women. In the warrior women ballads, the women are deployed to encourage male military recruitment to expand and strengthen the empire. Another of my projects under the scholarship tab on the site, I titled The Mad Exploit She Had Undertaken, a critical edition of Eliza Haywood's The Female Spectator, book 14, letter one. And in my research into Haywood, I found that um, there's a synonymous heroine named Eliana that uh, passes as a sailor to follow the lover who jilted her and so in this letter that's replete with editorial commentary from Haywood, she blends narrative techniques of fiction with seductive allure of the true story, offering a middle to upper class take that contrasts with the ballad's popular stance on the warrior women trope, which Haywood portrays as a mad exploit that is both, quote, unfortunate and ill-advised. Deconstructing and troubling notions of gender in the popular and scholarly imagination alike, the warrior women will continue to play a formative and vital role in future research projects on women's uh, quote unquote life writing in the long 18th century. Thank you. And finally, Lindsay. So I am the odd one out here who is not an early modern scholar. I'm actually a medievalist. So the research that we did specifically is not going to feature in my dissertation like it will for some of uh, my colleagues, but the process and the information that I, I've, I've gathered in this has been really helpful. Because we were encouraged to think so broadly in terms of uh, research topics, so our papers and our topics themselves are very, very different. After we had spent several weeks working in the database, tracking keywords and themes, I decided to do something similar on my second paper. I created my own spreadsheet, which is available on the website, that tracked all the terms of endearment used throughout the ballads, paying particular attention to who said them and at what time. This quickly turned into a much larger project than I had initially planned, but I stuck it out. And when I got around to writing the paper, I realized I would also have to do some changes, uh, make some changes in the, my writing style, because the data was actually lending itself much more uh, clearly to a, a scientific style paper. So, in the, in the project, I, I answered, asked and answered several questions regarding the use of terms of endearment, um, including what do the terms of endearment that the woman warrior and the uh, cis male lover use imply about their relationship and feelings toward one another? 
How and why do the terms of endearment change when the woman warrior is cross-dressed? And do they change again when the woman warrior reverts, if the woman warrior reverts to female dress? So I did feel like I got some answers with my data, but the exciting part for me was making that data available on the website so that more people can use it to do the research in the future. Uh, my, my analysis was very preliminary, and I'm hoping that people using the website will be able to take the basic data gathering that I've used and build off of it and do some really exciting and new things. And having the website available as a place to publish both the essay and the raw data is exciting because it will allow people to easily access that and use it going forward to maybe make something really exciting. Thank you all. This has been a wild tour of a lot of big ideas. So we'll welcome questions if there's a format that enables it. And, and we're really looking forward to participating in the conference together. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching this talk, which was part of the Gender and Sexuality panel. If you haven't already, go check out the other two talks in this panel by clicking the links on screen now.